Hi everyone, hope you're all doing well. My name is Jonah and I play cello. I'm excited to talk to you about Beethoven today, but before we get started, there's a few questions that I received from your community and I thought by answering them, you can get to know me a little better before we start. The first question comes in from a Ms. Kirsten Pullman from the Hartman School. She wants to know how I first became interested in classical music. Well, I come from a family of music lovers and my parents played music in the house all the time growing up. Um, they gave me my very first instrument when I was six and I gave my cello recital debut when I was seven and I haven't stopped performing since. So looking back, I'm both humbled and so inspired that I found my calling in life at such a young age and I'm very, very grateful for that. Next question. Who is your personal hero and why? Well, especially in times like these, first responders and medical professionals are risking their lives every day to make us feel safer and sometimes literally saving our lives. So day in and day out, they are the true heroes and I'm very grateful for everything they do for us. Growing up, I had a very different kind of hero. I had a musical hero and his name was Ludwig van Beethoven. He was born in the year 1770, so in 2020, we are celebrating his 250th birth year. Now we're celebrating it very early because he wasn't born until December, but this is how popular he still is today. Now I want to play you a song and I would like to know how many of you recognize it. Ah, for release. What a beautiful song. I love that song. I thought you would recognize it. But did you know that it was Beethoven? Now, the world in 1770 was a very different place. They didn't have electricity yet. They didn't have cars yet. They didn't have anything with an on switch. No iPhones, no video games. How did they live? Now, let's take a look at what else was happening in the world in 1770 when Beethoven was born. So the U.S. was not even born yet. It was before the Revolutionary War, and Australia was actually found that year by British Captain James Cook. Captain Cook landed the HMS Endeavour in Botany Bay on April 28, 1770. And so he named it Botany Bay because there were all these new uh, plants and organisms that Europeans had never seen before. More than a thousand species of things that Europeans had just never seen before. Isn't that fascinating? So he and his friend, the scientist, they named this place Botany Bay. And I believe it's just south of where Sydney is um, today. So anyway, this was happening in, in uh, Australia down under. Back in Europe, a 14-year-old Marie Antoinette is moving to the French courts to marry Louis XVI, who is the last king of France. Now, the year before that, I think, uh, Napoleon is born, so there's that very interesting connection. So exciting things were happening in the world, and in the cultural world, um, in the musical universe, the epicenter was um, Vienna. Uh, this is in Austria, and this is the place where Mozart and Haydn lived. Beethoven, being born in Bonn, a small city in Germany, grew up wanting to be just like Mozart. Mozart was this child prodigy, and so Beethoven wanted to be just that, and and he did. So he, he made his big splash playing the well-tempered clavier by Johann Sebastian Bach. The 
Well-Tempered Clavier is one of the most important works in music history. Bach wrote a prelude and fugue in every key, challenging inventors to make a piano that could play in every key. Now, this is a small part of why um, we consider Bach to be the father of music. And now, if Bach is the father of music, then surely Beethoven is the son. If I were to describe Bach's music in one word, I would say that it's perfect. That's how I would describe it. If, if I were to describe Beethoven in a word, I would say that it's heroic. And, you know, this idea of the hero, heroism, plays actually a really big part in, in both the life of Beethoven and his music. In 1791, Beethoven's childhood hero, Mozart, passes away. The next year, Beethoven decides that he's going to move to Vienna himself. He's received a scholarship from his hometown, and he's studying counterpoint with Haydn and Italian opera with Salieri. Now, what he really wants is to be seen as Mozart's successor. But composition isn't even his primary focus yet. He's so busy concertizing. Somehow, Beethoven manages to write a lot of music. We're talking about a couple of symphonies, we're talking about two cello sonatas, eight violin sonatas, like, what is it, six string quartets, 20 piano sonatas, an unbelievable amount of music, actually. And all of this music, he's designed it to sound like Mozart. And this period, his first days in Vienna, we call this his early period, and it's the first of three phases in Beethoven's musical legacy. Now, as he's getting a little bit older, Beethoven begins to lose his hearing, which is trouble for a musician, right? So then he slows down and he stops playing as many concerts. This does wonders for his composition, so he has more time to write now. Beethoven's heroic period is like a list of his greatest works, his greatest hits, everything he wrote, like from the Eroica Symphony on, like everything is gold. The Eroica Symphony literally means heroic symphony. He was going to dedicate it to Napoleon, and then he was told that Napoleon was not so much of a hero, he scratched that idea. But everything he wrote had this very heroic quality that was already there in early Beethoven, but now it was just more present and even more Beethoven, if that's even possible. He's he's writing things like the Violin Concerto and, and the Triple Concerto, the Kreutzer Sonata, the Appassionata Sonata, Wallstein. I mean, everything he writes is gold. Three Razumovsky string quartets, all three of them, unbelievable music. The Fifth Symphony, yeah, bah, bah, bah. quintessential Beethoven, right? Um, but he's not done, like, he's writing the Sixth Symphony at the same time, and right after that, Sixth Symphony, by the way, is the music that the old Disney Fantasia, um, just about everybody's heard it. Um, the next piece he writes is Opus 69, the Cello Sonata, a major, one of my favorite pieces ever written. Then he writes two piano trios, Opus 70, one of which is the Ghost Trio. Everything he's writing now is gold. Emperor Piano Concerto, the Harp Quartet, oh my goodness, the Harp Quartet. What a fantastic piece of music. I have to play you some of this music. I'm going to play all four parts and listen for how the, the pizzicato is passed around in the string parts to make it sound like a harp.
What a fantastic piece of music. I love the harp quartet, and I hope you enjoy that as well. Did you hear what I mean about the heroic quality in Beethoven's music? It was in this heroic period that Beethoven meets Goethe. And he didn't like him very much at first because he thought that Goethe enjoyed the popularity and the attention more than a poet should. But they start working together anyway, and it leads to Beethoven composing the Egmont Overture for him, which is one of his best works. It is so uplifting and it's so thrilling that it reminds me of one of Beethoven's famous quotes, that music should strike fire from the heart of man and draw tears from the eyes of woman. So Beethoven was a really strong believer in this kind of drama and heroism. He thought of his friend Goethe as a literary hero. He wanted to think of his friends as heroes. He was himself a musical hero and for him, this was everything, and, and, and this kind of faith is what sees him through this next phase in life that he's about to endure. Around 1812, he's writing symphonies 7 and 8, and it's a huge success. Like, symphony number 7, the only thing more famous is the 5th. The funeral march from this is maybe one of the most timeless pieces of music that we have. He should have felt like he was on top of the world, but he couldn't compose another note. And for years, he lost his brother, his immortal beloved, breaks his heart, runs off with a wealthy guy, marries him. He writes this 10-page love letter to her and never even sends it. I mean, things are not looking good for Beethoven. On top of all of this, he's now lost hearing in both of his ears, completely. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for a musician to lose his hearing? Completely. I mean, he would joke that now he could hear the divine inspiration in his, in his mind without, without interruption from the outside. But it must have felt like the end. Anyone else would have given up completely. But Beethoven does not give up. He overcomes his impossible. He perseveres, but not like you would think. He doesn't just get right back up. He's very wise. He takes his time. He's patient, and he studies. He looks back at Bach, and studies Bach again. Now with his maturity and added insight from experience and life, he's able to understand Bach in a deeper way. And only then does he start composing again. And while he's not the knight in shining armor that he used to be, he's something more regal and more spiritual, more mature than before. And he gives us maybe his most meaningful period, the late period. Beethoven in his late period is revolutionary. He's writing music unlike anything anyone has ever heard before. Just revolutionary. The Ninth Symphony is so much more than a symphony. He's writing things like the Grosso Fugue, I mean, for a string quartet, this, this, this work, even today, people struggle to understand it. He's doing so many creative things. And what's fascinating for me is, looking at his music now, it's clear to me that, that this was the work of Bach. I mean, it's because he studied Bach. And it's clear to me, if you heard the music, it'd be clear to you too. Let's take, for example, Opus 109, okay? It's the, it's the first of the last three piano sonatas. It's uh, 109, 110, 111, the last, last three piano sonatas of Beethoven. 109 is the one we're talking about. The first movement is like the sound of, of divine inspiration. It's like a music box from heaven descending into your ears. And then the second movement, also really short, is like a, it's like a fiery temperamental thing that like a young Beethoven would have written in his, in his, like early in his heroic period. But the real gem for me is the last movement, the finale, is a set of variations on a theme that reminds me of the Goldberg variations in the simplicity of the theme and the journey that it takes you on and the way he brings the theme back at the end, like Bach does in the Goldberg variations. It's like, it's like I can hear Beethoven pay homage to Bach saying, you know, everything I've learned, I learned from you. from 
Bonn, who wanted to be a child prodigy just like Mozart, went so much further than that. Taking his seat in the pantheon of the immoral composers next to Bach. This is the story of Beethoven and how he overcame every struggle life threw his way, becoming his own hero, setting an example for all of us. Thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed the music and the talk, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for future content. Please stay healthy and safe, and I hope to get to share music with you in person soon. Bye. Thank you.